Hello and welcome to Casual Krakoa, Comic Book Herald Live. Here, everybody, I'm Dave Busick, founder and editor in chief of ComicBookHerald.com. Coming to you from the past, coming to you from the distant past, an unshaven past, where I was not but a boy, not but a lad, nonetheless. Here to talk comics with you all for your life. You're seeing it. I impulsively shaved this weekend. Listen, I don't feel any better about it than you do, but we're here and it's happening. All right, let's talk about some good comics today. We got Judgment Day number three. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, Listen, don't worry. The the facial hair grows back. I I shaved 20 minutes ago, and we already got stubble. Okay? We already got stubble going. It's going to be fine. It's going to be okay. I'm convincing myself more than I'm convincing you. We're not just here to talk about uh, (laughs) beards and uh, and being spoken to by a baby. I don't know. Am I less? Are are Dave Stenese's predictions less valid coming from a baby? Then they right like is little baby Nathan less of a cable than the Ascani son? It's hard to say, right? It's hard to say. Um, let's do this. Let's talk about comics. Okay, we got Judgment Day number three out today. We got Marauders number five, which is not a Judgment Day event tie-in. Uh, and then we'll talk about some other stuff. All right, come on, horrific, horrific in the comments. That's a little strong. <laughs> It's fine. We'll cut to the screenshots of the comics today. My goodness, horrific. Killing me. Absolutely murdering me. Uh, I'm going to pull up my notes on the comments. They were fairly sparse, but don't worry. We'll have plenty to talk about. Get in your questions and your thoughts and anything that you want to chat about here in the live chat. For those of you who are joining live, much appreciated, of course, that you're here. Uh, as always, I'm Dave with ComicBookHerald.com. You can find myself over on ComicBookHerald.com, including reading orders for the full Judgment Day event, including reading orders for the full Destiny of X, including reading orders for all of Marvel history, and all sorts of great content over on Comic Book Herald. If you like the YouTube channel, the conversations we have here, of course, like and subscribe to Comic Book Herald. Uh, you can find stuff like this. You can find the videos I do, Crack and Krakoa. I got a good one coming up on Mutants and Celestials history. And uh, and I just had a really good chat with Blurred Without Fear, a.k.a. Ernie, uh, talking Hickman East of West, Hickman and Nick Dragota for Hickmania. Number eight in the series. We've been reading every Jonathan Hickman creator owned comic throughout one a month throughout this year. We did East to West this month. I had a great talk with Blur Without Fear about that one. You can find that on the live streams because we did it live as well. All right. All right. I'm seeing a lot of concern about my naked face. <laughs> like, like more concern than I expected. We're jumping to the images. This is too much. This is too much for me to take. Let's dive right in to Judgment Day number three. This one, of course, again, Karen Gillan, Valerio Shidi. Third issue in an event series that is six issues and an Omega, so basically seven issues. We've gotten only a smattering of tie-in so far. Like, last week was basically our first major tie-in week with X-Men and um, one of the others, Immortal, sort of carrying the torch there. Uh, we now get the third event series, and I gotta say, like, big picture, I'm still incredibly happy with the way this event is proceeding. Oh, BT Dubs, as you're probably seeing on the screen now, spoilers will follow, okay? We're gonna be talking about this comic in depth. Uh, if you have not read it and you don't want to be spoiled on what happens, then by all means, definitely go read it. Go check it out, because Judgment Day's been really good. I think I'm already at a point, I'm already at a place where it's my favorite uh, event post Secret Wars, my favorite Marvel Universe event post Secret Wars. Now, if we get into the very semantically driven arguments about, okay, is it one of the best events published by Marvel since Secret Wars? Uh, where do we put Hoxpox in those rankings? Some folks are very pro House of X and Powers of Ten is an event. Uh, Shelf Dust, a site run by Steve Morris, good site, shelfdust.com, currently running a comics critics poll on uh, your 10 favorite events of all time, one that I've participated in. And my first go round, I did not include House of X and Powers of 10 as like a Marvel Universe event. I consider it a maxi series. I consider it an X-Men series. They are, for the purposes of that polling, the best comic book events of all time, they are in fact including House and Powers. So I had to weave that back in to my top 10. I think it wound up fifth or sixth, I want to say. Um, it's not... It's definitely not a top three-er for me, um, but I'll, I'll have to give that a look again because it did throw a wrench into my votes. I, of course, have 2015 Secret Wars number one, uh, and I think I had 
Oh man, now I can't remember anything. I'll, I'll look that up if it keeps going and people are curious about my top event rankings. But I don't really think of House and Powers that way. Some folks do, right? So that's going to throw a wrench into like, like Judgment Day is not better than House and Powers, right? Like I, I would not say that. I am not prepared to say that. But if we're looking at Marvel Universe-wide crossover type stuff, so the comparisons here would be King and Black. They would be War of the Realms. Uh, they would be, uh, who could forget, Civil War II, <laughs> right? Those sorts of things. Then for me, Judgment Day is already, I think, my favorite since Secret Wars. I mean, War of the Realms is probably probably number two in there. Um, but that one, I don't know, War of the Realms is a fine ending to a great run. And the greatness of the run of the Jason Aaron and Isadorovich and Matthew Dodderman and Matthew Wilson, or not Matthew, Russell Dodderman and Matthew Wilson, Thor stuff, because those runs are so good, and it's such a good Thor story, War of the Realms has a, a relative satisfaction. Um, but as like a standalone event, it's all right. It's all right. It's still Dodderman and Wilson in art, so it looks amazing. Like, I, I think War of the Realms is artistically the best event since Secret Wars, just because I love the combo platter of Dowderman and Wilson. That's no shade on what Sheedy's doing here on Judgment Day. All of which is to say, I'm really into this event. It's been very good. As Marvel Universe events go, it's doing a nice job. Doing a real nice job. I'm digging it. It's also moving fast, and I love that for this, okay? Uh, one, you know, we talked about this last time. With Marvel event comics... Sometimes the speed at which they need to deliver big hits and big plot points can really be detrimental to just telling a high-quality story, right? The way that an ongoing narrative might take time and take pauses and spaces to have conversations with certain characters and get a feel for how they're dealing with things, um, events can often run into a problem where they just don't have time and space to do that. That said, you also want to avoid an event comic that feels like it is meandering very tediously, right? And that it's not going anywhere. So it's a very difficult tightrope act to walk. I think Gillen is walking it splendidly right now. You know, one trick that I sort of realized today with the third issue is Gillen is avoiding the event trap of big action battle sequences being the primary, like, form of plot and narrative being shared. Right. And this is a thing that happens like it's kind of an expectation of events that like, oh, it's going to be real showy. Massive explosions are going to happen. And obviously something like Judgment Day, which is also subtitled Avengers vs. X-Men vs. Eternals. There's an expectation that we are going to see those super teams at war with each other for substantial portions of this comic. And that actually has not been the case in many, many ways. Right. That has not been a major focus. Um, instead, Instead, we're getting more of a focus on conversations between characters, on the philosophy of what's happening, on the, the sort of um, strategic and political gambles that characters are taking. All of that stuff is more interesting. All of that stuff is always more interesting, right? Look at Game of Thrones. Look at Succession. Look at stuff that is tremendously, tremendously popular and critically acclaimed and can do so at scale. It's not the dragons in Game of Thrones, right? It's the conversations and the politics, right? I'm not the first person to point this out. Gillen generally seems to be getting that here, even as you also have, oh, by the way, a newly created celestial god made by two Eternals, Tony Stark and Mr. Sinister. What could go wrong, right? Well, in this case, what goes wrong is the newly created god stops for a time the Eternals' war on Krakoa, the mutant island nation, but then it also says, I'm going to judge Earth in 24 hours, I'm going to judge each person, and if there is enough worthiness, if basically if more than half of you are decent, cool, carry on. If less than half of you suck, uh, that's it. You're all going to die, <laughs> right? So they've created essentially a crazed celestial, uh, although really just a celestial. Like, that's kind of what the celestials do. They come, they hold up the thumb to the side, a la Roman Emperor, and they say yay or nay on whether or not humanity is an experiment that should carry on into the future. Okay, so you've got a celestial doing that, and all the while you've got the Eternals and the X-Men still at war, right? Druig re-ups the war here. Okay, basically, and re-ups the attacks on Krakoa. We see a very casual psychic annihilation of Professor X 
in this series, you know, and that's kind of what I'm saying when I say the focus is not on the battle, right? The focus is not on the action. Professor X just casually dies. <laughs> Emma very casually says, um, hey, we're going to need another Professor X, right? They are in the midst of a war, and that is not shocking. That is not the point. This is not a death of Professor X story. We're telling a story with two factions fighting, Eternals and X-Men, who can resurrect, right? Who come back? They are eternal. They are immortal. That is the point. You don't need to focus the story on those beats. So I think very wisely, instead, what we're getting is the decision-making and the politics and the thinking, and that all is a much more interesting story. It's working very, very well. I do think, you know, so we're halfway through the event, right, plus an Omega issue. I do think some of these tie-ins are going to need to step up a little bit, right? X-Men Red written by Al Ewing, had a great tie-in issue. It's going to need one or two more. Immortal X-Men, I'm hoping for more in the next tie-in issue, right? It's going to need just a handful of conversations and moments on the fringes of things that really make this, I think, a more satisfying experience. Um, but all in all, I'm in on this event. It's fun. It's good. It's smart. It is, you know, and we've talked about this too, like it is asking a very giant and unanswerable yet interesting question, which is the Celestial's primary premise here, which is, is humanity worth it, right? And that is something that, as you look at just like a deluge of news items and, and just be, you know, being online and just that feeling of, is everything awful? Is everything awful all the time? Oh, God, somebody help, somebody do something? Uh, or is there some decency in the world, right? And what I think is interesting here in the third issue, so you have Captain America, who would almost always be the representation here of, yes, there's decency in the world, and I, I think we can prove to this mad God that, you know, humanity is worth it. Um, the Celestial Judge's cap a failure, <laughs> right? In one single page, the, the, the uh, progenitor, the Celestial here, says, Cap, you're a representation of America. America is torn and, and badly, badly bruised, and uh, you are supposed to represent these people. This is a supposed to be a leader, and look what America represents currently. And it really resonates, and it really resonates, and the judge judges Captain America as a failure. So that sets the, the, the scene here, and it sets the expectation that the progenitor is not going to uh, have an easy grading curve by any measure. I don't know if this is literally true, but I the only person I remember getting a passing grade on the decency scale from the progenitor in this is Warlord Crow <laughs> of the Deviants, which is wild. Mystique and Destiny don't pass. Emma Frost doesn't pass. Cap didn't pass. There are others as well. Okay, so it's not looking so good purely on a, well, just let him judge us um, thing. Because even, even if that was happening somewhat fairly, you know, it would be a dicey scenario. Uh, I, I also am loving, I'm really loving the cutaways to the human perspectives throughout each issue of Judgment Day has been kind of the masterstroke um, with six humans tied to these. I, I picked up, like, I probably, I thought these are probably the humans who were tied to the hex. Um, but honestly, regardless of whether they are or not, and tied to them in the sense that a human has to die when an Eternal is resurrected, so I think they're connected in that way. Um, but even if that's not the case, and they're just like six random human perspectives, uh, it's really effective. It's a really effective way of getting feet on the ground. You know, Busiak and Ross Marvel style, just like what do people think about what is happening in this insane world that they live in, right? When In a world where you have giant cosmic deities, manufactured cosmic deities, um, announcing inside your head the world has 24 hours to prove that you're worth it. And you have like a scene, like a dad telling his kid, like, well, you still need to do your homework. <laughs> like, like it actually gives you a really good sense of what it's like to be average and normal in the Marvel Universe. You so rarely get that in Marvel events. I mean, almost never. Almost never. I can think of, obviously, I mentioned Busiak and Ross with Marvels. You know, it's kind of the premise of that classic 1994 series. Um, something like Civil War Frontline, actually. I think Paul Jenkins wrote those. Uh, for for all the criticisms that might apply, 
Frontline was a look at, like, you know, journalists looking at, okay, what's the fallout of something like Civil War and what's the impact on us, the people around it? Um, you don't often get it in the event itself. And the fact that it's here is, is really cool and really smart and effective. Uh, one of the biggest things that happens in Judgment Day number three is Mr. Sinister finally makes a move. Uh, Mr. Sinister was kidnapped by Ajak and Makri, uh, the, the two Eternals who are you know, basically the religious arm of the Eternals, and uh, and they kidnap Mr. Sinister because of his connections to the Dreaming Celestial way back in Karen Gillan's Uncanny X-Men run when Mr. Sinister hijacked the Dreaming Celestial's head and used it as a fun little spaceship slash power source <laughs> and also transformed it into having a red diamond on its forehead because, of course... Um, so Mr. Sinister makes his play. He, he tells Destiny, like, hey, here's what's up. And he also says, hey, I know how to stop the Celestial. Send in the X-Men. Um, Destiny foresees no devastation. Okay, so she's like, yeah, let, they have a vote. They do it. There's a risk of devastation because apparently if the progenitor blows up, it will be a real problem. We get a couple pages, a couple pages where it looks like that's what happened. And Sinister, you know, his scheming is he doesn't, he clearly doesn't care, right? He's like, if I die, I'll be resurrected. Um, but all the rest of you, you know, will have stopped this insane celestial and then I can carry on with my plans. And I suspect by the end of this stream, we're going to talk a little bit about what's coming in 2023 because obviously it's going to be sinister heavy if you've seen that announcement. Okay. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go, but sinister, you know, that's, that's part of his plan. Like that works for him. Um, and also, you know, if you remember from immortal X-Men, like he dies, it all just goes in the, in the information tubes that he's got having hacked and cloned Moira's ability like now he just files that into okay and next time here's what i'll do during the uh during the judgment day saga you know uh, the x-men run in a little bit blind like they kind of look like fools um but as you know because gene like runs in blows up the celestial super easily uh it creates massive devastation they all die towns all die except that's actually a fake out i i do admit it kind of i was like 62 percent Sure, it wasn't really happening, but there was a decent chunk of me that was like, oh, like, wow, we're going here. We're going here. This this celestial is actually going to cause incredible devastation, and the blame is going to be laid at the feet of all the superpowers, right? And we're kind of going to get a all superpowers are bad perspective and, and real ramp, really ramp that up a la Stanford for Civil War, right? But on an even larger scale. But no, we're not doing that. At least we're not doing that yet. Uh, because the Celestial tricked all of the X-Men and everyone involved, and it was all psychic uh, projection, okay? So they did not actually blow up the Celestial, and it did not actually destroy huge swaths of humanity. Let's see. Other major developments. We got three, as far as I see it. Uh, I'm going to start with the most important one first. We got a dupe sighting. We got a dupe sighting. In the battle sequence, everybody, in, in Judgment Day number three, confirmed dupe sighting. That's D-O-O-P for you novices at home. From the pages of Ecstatics, now in your Marvel Comics event, dupe showed up for war. Dupe showed up for battle. Why? Who cares? Dupe is here bringing the funk, going to take out some Eternals. That That's the thing about, you know, with the, the X-Men attacking the Celestial. All of the Eternals, even the ones who disagree, they have their three directives. They are like Asimov's robots, okay? The three laws of robotics, they have to comply. They have to protect Celestials. I do not think we have seen an instance, at least not yet, of like an Icarus being like, well, I, I will fight that. I will avoid that. They can't. They have to do it. So they go into battle. Dupe is there. That's how you know the mutants are going to win, okay? One way you know that the mutants are going to have a hard time reconciling their continuity is Quentin Quire's also in this scene. And if you've been reading X-Force, um, if you haven't, you'd be forgiven. But if you've been reading X-Force, Quentin Quire's been dead and unresurrectable for a minute. Does this mean that the last three or so issues of X-Force all have to come after Judgment Day? I don't care. <laughs> I have to be honest. It's probably just a continuity snafu, and this thing was drawn before that happened, right? Before that plot point was decided. These things happen. And then, and then lunatics like myself have to figure it out. Uh, but again, the important thing here, dupe, sighting. First one in a long time. Second important thing, the deviants come calling to Krakoa. Not only that, I, I anticipated an alliance between the X-Men and the deviants. Again, remember, Druig, prime eternal right now, leader of the Eternals, 
has declared war on the mutants in the name of one of the Eternals' prime directives, which is correcting excess deviation, right? And he's saying, okay, mutants are also deviants, but that means that the mutants and deviants have a ton in common. The deviants can use Krakoan gates. Uh, that's a semi-big deal. Now, I called this alliance. I'm not surprised by that, that they're teaming up. Uh, I think that's great, and I think that's smart, and I think as we look for make more mutants to come into play, if you start to sort of allow alliances or, or you know, like almost like a genetic cousin with the deviants and mutants, that's a great way to expand this territory and this reign. It's probably going to be more like an alliance, than it is, like, you know, literally calling them mutants. Um, but the fact that they use Krakoan Gates, the way it's talked about here is, is very vague, but it's just like, oh, our DNA is close enough. <laughs> Which, like, okay, sure, sure, why not? Um, but that's a semi-big deal, okay? And the final big deal is David Bowie's here. We got Bowie, 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 Bowie. David Bowie on the scene. Cersei breaks in to the Eternals' exclusion and is here to break out, not Thanos, not Uranus, which I was worried is where we were heading, breaking out Star Fox. We have not seen Eros, a.k.a. Star Fox, to my knowledge, since the Donny Cates written Guardians of the Galaxy, where Cates wrote sort of an evil mastermind version of Star Fox, who had his face badly scarred, and then I think was, did he get thrown into space? I don't remember. Like, I think he died. I'm, I'm reasonably sure he died. It's not surprising that he's been in the exclusion, although I had forgotten to think about it. Okay? I definitely had forgotten to, like, actually consider, even though there is a tie-in, there is a tie-in with, um, with Star Fox coming, which is going to be written by Kieran Gillen. Okay? Which is, which is fun stuff. Now, listen, I'm not, like, any kind of massive Star Fox fan, or anything. I mean, I think he is historically most interesting because he's Thanos' brother. I think basically everyone recognizes this. It'll be a really interesting challenge for a creator like Gillen, who is fantastic, um, to try to sort of figure out what Star Fox can be outside of Thanos' shadow. I mean, I don't think that's a thing that's been really effectively done. I actually think Jim Starlin did a pretty inter interesting job of this with his most recent series of graphic novels, the ones he did with Alan Davis on art, the ones that he really badly didn't want to finish because he had the exact same idea as as Donny Cates, Thanos Win, and Marvel Editorial approved both of them. <laughs> really rubbed him the wrong way. Um, but uh, but he does some interesting things with Star Fox and those. Nonetheless, it's going to be an interesting character. It's an interesting reveal. It is not the one I expected, and that's good. Oh, speaking of Thanos... Speaking of Thanos, this has come up several times on the Comic Herald side of things. Several of you, several of you, you know who you are, have said to me, Dave, Thanos is in the Janice Val miniseries, <laughs> the son of Captain Marvel miniseries written by Peter David. Are we going to talk about that? I thought he was dead in the pages of Eternal. You're some sort of Thanos expert, right? Mr. Thanos reading order, right? What's going on? All I got to say, I read the issue. I read the issue. I'm so mad I had to read the issue. Very upset. Very upset with you all. I told you so. It's almost say, I told you so. Come on. Come on. Come at the king. You best not miss. Uh, the reason I was singing Bowie in that voice is, one, as a reference to Fly of the Concords, fantastic show, uh, and two, because Star Fox is redesigned as David Bowie, um, who I guess for the kids, kind of kind of Harry Styles-ish, you know, from the Eternals movie, but come on. It's Bowie. It's Bowie. Bowie. All right. That's enough of that. <laughs> uh, I think that's it. I think that's all the big stuff from Judgment Day number three. Uh, we got a question here in the chat, and I'm sure there's more than one, but this one I'm seeing, do you think Thanos will show up at all? Hmm. <laughs> we talked about this after the first couple issues uh, at the time. So initially, he was, he was one of the characters I thought, like, yeah, you might have to turn to Thanos, you know, if you're Druid, to, to put everything back in the box. He's hesitant right now. There's a line here where Jurg actually goes and visits Uranus, and he's basically like, things are not yet bad enough that I need to let you out again. Like, Jurg recognizes it was a massive risk, a calculated risk, to let Uranus out once. Okay? He did it. 
Uranus destroyed the hell out of Araco. We're still, we still need to see what the Hour of Magneto is going to look like in terms of follow-up there. Um, but he did it once, and he doesn't want to do it again. Uh, and that's good, right? <laughs> like, Turk should recognize, okay, that's going to be a mistake. Would he do the same thing with Thanos? Maybe thinking he can, he can conquer him again? I don't know. It kind of doesn't seem like it. Kind of doesn't seem like it. We just went through in Hail Thanos, the second arc of Eternals. Druig, like, like his plan had to work to perfection, and it did to get out of that, but you also had Thanos as the Eternal Prime thinking he had killed Druig. The second he sees Druig or has an opportunity, he's going to kill him again, right? He's going to kill him again. So, I mean, like, that would be a bad play, I think it's safe to say, by Druig. So are we going to see Thanos again in Judgment Day? I don't actually... Hmm... <clears throat> It's tough. It's tough. I don't think we will. I don't think we will. I think it's going to be Star Fox finally getting out of the exclusion. Um, could he be the one to be like, hey, let's let Thanos out and he'll help us and I'm his brother and I have an idea? Possibly? Because Star Fox makes bad decisions, uh, but I don't see that. I still think it's more likely that we see Apocalypse. Um, I'm seeing Open Mike Eagle here saying Star Fox is hella sexier. I assume that's in reference to Harry Styles, not David Bowie. If we can get confirmation on that... <laughs> That would be fantastic. Uh, it, plus, with Star Fox, the thing you have to worry about is he has, you know, pheromone emotion control abilities. So it's like, do I actually think he's hella sexier or is he using his powers to make me think that? There's a lot of issues. Real real problematic dude. <laughs> real problematic dude. A lot of issues with coercion with Star Fox, uh, some of which are gross and some of which need to be worked out very intelligently. I trust that Kieran Gillen is the one to do so. Okay, I think we got it. Let's see, get in some questions here, uh, get in some thoughts on Judgment Day number three. I'm going to take a quick swig of this uh, wonderful Illinois Chicago lake water, <laughs> and uh, I'll be back in a moment. That's the stuff. That's the stuff. All right, I'm seeing here, if we don't get Thanos vs. Apocalypse, what is the point of comics at all? This is a really fair point. This is a really fair point. If you want to make the most exciting Marvel event you can make, and you want everyone to be talking about it, and you want to sell a gajillion copies, then you do bring Thanos and Apocalypse into the back half of this event. With that logic which is fairly compelling, <laughs> there seems like a much better chance that we see Thanos in this book. Um, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Because if you're Gillen, as the storyteller, he did the Thanos thing. I mean, that's what the first 12 issues of Eternals are. And make no mistake, Judgment Day, this is the Eternals event. You know, yes, it's Axe. Yes, it's Avengers versus X-Men versus Eternals. But this is the Eternals event. If Eternals were bigger, and if that, maybe even if just if that movie had done better, you know, this would be an Eternals titled event. This is the continuation. Yes, he's got X-Men stuff because, of course, he's writing Immortal X-Men and is a huge part of the X-Office right now, um, but this is an Eternals-led event right here, and Gillen did the Thanos thing. He made, first off, he told a great Thanos story. Second off, he made Thanos work in the Eternals in ways that no one had done before. Um, and it's hugely, hugely valuable to the Marvel Universe tapestry and also the potential of the types of eternal stories you can tell. I mean, there is there is absolutely no understating how much more interesting the Eternals franchise is after Gillen's 12-issue run. Now, we don't have any kind of information or, or confirmation as to whether the Eternal series could continue post-Judgment Day. You know, um, it's it's there's no announcement as of this time. I mean, I, I, I've been predicting and sort of anticipating. I don't think they're going to be eternal after the end of this. I don't think they are going to be resurrected and have eternal life. And, you know, the thing with that is you could say, OK, well, do a story then where they they have to come to terms with not being eternal and, and with having limited shelf lives, except that's literally been done. Um, that's a big part of the 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 Knopf brothers. I don't know if I'm saying that even close to right. It's K-N-A-U-F. Uh, the brothers, they wrote an Eternal series in 2008, 2009. There's actually an X-Men crossover in there called uh, Manifest Destiny. And uh, that's a big part of that run is the, the resurrection machines are broken. 
essentially, right? So going that route is, I mean, listen, it's a very rarely talked about story that happened 14 years ago. So you can do something like that and do it in a different way. Um, but it feels a little old hat. It feels a little tired, you know, because it's literally been done. All right. So, but yes, I mean, I think the argument of Thanos and Apocalypse showing up together, I just, it, that's a lot of heavy lifting. That would actually, that, that would take a lot of fast moving heavy lifting over the course of a back half of, of an event because you need explanations for both those characters. Like as of right now, both those characters are off the board. Right? I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm not saying it wouldn't be as exciting as hell. But to get Thanos back, you have to... Presumably, he's sitting in an exclusion sort of prison a la Star Fox. Although, actually, isn't he... He was outside of the Resurrection Machines. Now maybe he's a part of it. I don't remember exactly. Um, so maybe he's not just sitting in a prison. Either way, you have to bring him back to life, clarify that, and then have a reason that the Eternals or anyone would set him free. Now, if you get the thing where Druig uh, turns to Uranus and he says, hey, this is all going wrong. I actually need you again, despite my best instincts. Uranus breaks free, and then he does ascend to power and finally flips the script on Druig, which feels like the inevitable way this goes, right, is, is Druig loses control, Uranus takes over. Maybe one of his first actions are bringing back Thanos. Right? Maybe one of his first actions is like, okay, now I can get Thanos in my pocket. He's an asset. Um, I'll definitely use my quote-unquote grandson here, you know? So I, that uh, that would be interesting, right? So you get Thanos back on the board. The, the way to get Apocalypse on the board doesn't seem that far-fetched. Um, but again, as of right now, Apocalypse is off the board. He's in Amenth, which is uh, kind of a different dimension. We don't really have a good sense of like what the communication <laughs> or or possible connections of Amenth and our Earth are. You know, definitely the end of Ten of Swords, when Apocalypse goes with his family, goes with his wife and his the horseman of the Apocalypse, his, the first horseman, his children, and he goes back to Amenth. I mean, the implication is that like he can't just come hang out on Krakoa. And the implication is that like they may never see him again, right? Um, now, we know, obviously, he will come back. I mean, it's been teased in Sinister Secrets. It's it's a thing, like, you, you plant that seed so you can use it later. Um, the question is just how and why, and you have to explain it. Like, does Apocalypse get email in Amenth? I don't know, right? Like, like if Richter is emailing him and he's like, Big Daddy A, we need you. Um, there's problems on Arako. Does he even get that? Does he have a signal? I have no idea. Okay, you could explain it and you could do it. But again, like if you do that, you have three issues in an Omega to bring both those characters onto the scene. That just feels heavy. It just feels like a lot. I mean, I'd be excited about it. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. So I like your thinking. I like it a lot. I just don't think we have time. If we can get one, if we can get one of the two. And I'm rooting for Apocalypse here. I think it makes the most sense given what happened to Araka, given what happened to the Red Planet and, and their people. They got statues of Apocalypse on Mars, right? You got to come back. You got to come back and help with Uranus. I think that'd be dope. Okay, what other questions we got? Do you think we could potentially see Moira's judgment by the progenitor? Hey, remember Moira, everybody? <laughs> remember her? She was seen in issue number one, uh, selling out the mutants to Druig, being like, hey, if you take out the resurrection, um, that would be a nice touch. That would be a nice little scene. You know, um, it, like, it, it actually could go a decent way if you flipped it and, and the, um, if the progenitor was like, yeah, she's really onto something. She rules. Thumbs up. <laughs> you know, with the, with the comically evil Moira that we have right now. Uh, I don't think we'll see it. I don't think we'll see it, but I like the idea. All right, what do we got? Star Fox belongs on Krakoa since he's like mutants, all about making love. I, bet, I think Star Fox would greatly enjoy Krakoa. I think he would be a big, big fan. Uh, question here, isn't Thanos a mutant of his people? He's a, he's a mutant deviant, even, and that is something I have covered in depth on He's in Eternals number two. If you go to the Combo Carol ch channel, look for Is Thanos a Mutant? I talk about that a whole heck of a lot. But yeah, he, is, he has technically been classified as a mutant deviant of sorts. Um, it has never been 
really even implied or established that he has, like, the mutant gene like the X-Men do, but this is something that comes up in Marauders today, actually, Marauders number five, and something I've been beating the drum for for a long time. There are alien mutants, and that is a different thing than being a human with the X gene. And by that logic, I kind of feel like Thanos is sort of kind of a mutant. <laughs> so if people tell me no, that's not really right, and blah, 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 I actually think he kind of is. I think he's a mutant and an eternal. Um, maybe that's not how I answered it in the video, but that's how I feel now. I've come back around. All right, what else do we got? Uh, Bob uh, Bobeshir has a super chat. Thanks so much for your contribution. Highly, highly appreciated. Just want to contribute and say you and your channel means a lot, pal. Oh, thank you. I love that. I love hearing that. Thank you so much for your support and for saying something nice. That really, really means a lot. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, poor Richter misses his big blue lip daddy. Who doesn't? Who among us can say that we don't? Um, what else? What are your thoughts on the Sins of Sinister announcement? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we will do it. We will do the Sins of Sinister announcement. Maybe right now even. Maybe right now even. Um, I think Moira is secretly a double agent. Nathan says. She needs to get deep into Orcus to dismantle it. We've, we've talked about this theory before. Um, it feels like an actually really awesome semi-retcon. I kind of love it. Like, I, I actually do think if you got deep enough into it and we'd had comically evil Moira for long enough and then it was like, psych- She's been playing us all the whole time. Long con. Um, I could be into that. I could be really, really into that. I think it would be hard to sell. You'd have to do a lot of work to sell that it was an intentional decision. Like that everyone is doing that on purpose. Like, and then, and you know, you'd have to work on the how far back does it go. Right? Is all of Inferno calculated? And Moira's like, you have to kill me and turn me into an evil robot, Charlie. You have to do it. I'm the best friend he ever had. You know, like, did they have those conversations? Um, I, that'd be a lot of fun. That'd be a lot of fun. A throwback X-Men issue that is all flashback with Moira going to Magneto and being like, you know, I'm going to kidnap Spider-Man's wife. and I'm, I'm going to really threaten the killer and turn Proteus into a maniac at the Hellfire Gala. Right? Like, that would be, <laughs> like, we need a flashback explaining every Moira decision that has been made uh, because right now, the character has been run so far into the dirt that there are there are tree roots that are like, excuse me, you're too deep into the dirt right now. Like, pardon. Pardon us. <laughs> uh, I love that theory. That would be, that'd be super awesome. I don't, you know what, though? And, like, I don't even care if it makes sense at a certain point. Um, if Gillen and Ewing and the Brain Trust in the X office is like, you know what, like, this would be much cooler if Moira's on Krakoa's side again and we got back to what was good about how, like, just, like, admit a mistake has been made, right? That's okay. That's fine. You can admit a mistake has been made. Um, and then and then just say, okay, actually, she's been a secret double agent this whole time. Trick, she's going to dismantle Orcus and help the mutants again um, in her way, whatever that is, right? You can still be, she can still have nebulous schemes and not be an evil robot, you know? There are other ways, okay? Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm really into it. I'm really, really into it. Love it. Uh, does Fastos have a plan within plans here? I don't know. Fastos was was portrayed as being really strategic and interesting in the first arc of Eternals, and kind of ever since then, you know, he messed up with Thanos, as one does, as one does, right? If you play with the purple chin, you, you know, you can't make mistakes, and he did. And uh, so I, I don't anticipate he's going to be a major player in this because he's involved, too, with the building of the Celestial. But I expect it's Sinister who's got the schemes. You know, he's like, you know, turn the Celestial into a bomb type stuff. Um, Tony Stark is obviously going to have major, major plans here and, and some schemes as well. I, I don't think we're going to get a massive Fastos moment. Uh, it'd be cool if we did. It would be cool if we did. All right, what else do we got? Do, 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 do. I don't understand why Moira hates mutants so much. I mean, Moira can't figure out how to stop Nimrod, so maybe this is her next attempt at that. 
uh, the double agent thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm on board. Uh, do you think Amazing Spider-Man number nine will have big Moira ramifications? <sighs> That's a weird one. So the Amazing Spider-Man number nine issue is the tie-in to the Hellfire Gala, <laughs> which happened, what is it, two months ago now? Um, it's going to be the Spider-Man and Wolverine chasing down Moira to save Moira in MJ's body sequence. Uh, it's got to have some more ramifications, right? Which maybe could lead us into Dark Web. I don't know if there could be some connections there. That's going to be the crossover in Spider-Man X-Men stuff, uh, which seems to be Madeline Pryor driven, which now she's the Queen of Limbo per New Mutants. So how's that going to work? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't think we're going to see big Moira ramifications outside of Immortal X-Men. That's my prediction there. We, we will see something there because Sinister is very deliberately using Moira, um, but I don't think we'll see it anywhere else. Speaking of which, Sins of Sinister. We're going to talk about Sins of Sinister. Um, any thoughts on the mutant appearing from the 2099 future, Jay asks. Yeah, let's talk about that next. Let's talk about that next because that'll, that'll move us through Marauders number five. Okay, so Marauders number five. This one's written by Steve Orlando. Uh, this, this, this series I've been, I like some of the big ideas. Um, I, I like the time travel here, the last couple issues right now, this issue travels back to like nineties Avalon days. They actually make a call out to X-Men number 42 with Exodus on Avalon. Um, that's fun. I, Steve Orlando's never met a comic. He couldn't tie into the nineties and, and sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not here. It's very fun. Uh, we get Nemesis, AKA the artist formerly known as Holocaust can't imagine why he had to rebrand uh and uh no i can he needed to <laughs> he's nemesis now this is the son of apocalypse and uh and he's around he's fighting exodus mostly just so we can see that character not for any other re good reason um big developments from marauders number five like i said aliens or mutants too okay xandra professor x's daughter of sorts with lalandra empress of the shiar xandra is the empress of the shiar she died earlier in marauders xandra did and Professor X resurrects her fast, fast. All the time he spent saying, no, Legion, we can't resurrect you, my one and only son. He spends none of that time on Xandra, says, yeah, we got to resurrect you. Of course we would do it. Big shots at Legion. <laughs> if that relationship wasn't already a bloody mess, it certainly would be now. Um, but it got worse. It got worse. But Professor X resurrecting Xandra says two things. Uh, one, it declares her like resurrectable as a mutant, which has not been for sure. Uh, and it also kind of ensures that the mutant empire grows. There is a mutant empress on the throne of the Shi'ar. They are allies with Krakoa and, and Arako and, and the soul system. Um, but you literally have a mutant empress now who is resurrected via Krakoan resurrection protocols. That has power ramifications, I suspect. Okay, that's a big one. That's a big one, and I like it. Speaking of aliens or mutants too, um, Cassandra Nova turns into a Venom, and it's apparently a Venom with a uh, symbiote, or the symbiote has mutant DNA. I don't know. It's real dumb fun. <laughs> it's really dumb fun. I'm into it. I dig it. Again, I'm I'm a billion percent here for alien mutants and, and mutant kind expanding into the spaceways and making more mutants and expanding their empire that way. Um, these are small little ways to do that. And then, you know, the other thing in this arc in Marauders is... There's been this whole story about the first mutants, and there's kind of a Shi'ar genocide of those mutants. Um, but again, just establishing, like, there were a lot more mutants, and maybe there still are in some areas. How can that get tied into Krakoan expansion? Okay. Uh, the other big thing that happened in this issue, depending on your perspective, is there's a character that is resurrected, um, who shows up, wants to see, or she shows up after Kate Pride is resurrected after, and, uh, and it's, uh, Cerebra, which might not mean anything to you, but this is a character actually from X-Men 2099, a classic I've been sent from the future mutant, a la Bishop, a la Cable, except this one is Cerebra from X-Men 2099. Steve Orlando has written a decent chunk of 2099 stuff over the last four years, or so for Marvel, uh, clearly a space that he is comfortable with and enjoys. I own every issue of X-Men 2099, and there's not a lot I could tell you <laughs> about the franchise. I'm perpetually curious 
to go back and read it, but I think there's a reason the one, the 2009 stuff you hear about is Spider-Man and maybe Doom. Maybe Doom. You don't hear a heck of a lot about X-Men 2099. Now, does that mean nobody could do anything interesting with it? Of course not. Of course, there could be good stories told in the X-Men 2099 verse, um, but don't feel like you need to go back and read them all <laughs> unless you're doing a big old 2099 binge and you just got a hankering for some 90s comics, okay? Uh, but that's, I, I don't hate that, you know, an alternate reality, uh, time-traveling mutant showing up is, is often a good thing in X-Men universe, you know, and it's also something we have not seen much. Um, and it's something I realized, you know, with Tempo sending the Marauders team back in time here in Marauders number five is we haven't seen a lot of time travel stuff in this era of X-Men, right? We've talked about that, right? For the longest time, there were no precognitive mutants. So then it was kind of like, well, what do we make of time travel? And we kind of just didn't see it. You know, I think creators kind of just didn't want to mess with that. Um, but opening it back up and getting into that raises a lot of questions about like, what does Krakoa look like? in 2099, in this future, right? So there's a lot of multiverse time travel stuff that still is to be explored, I think, in the Krakoa space that could be super, super fun. Um, or at least open up some really interesting possible stories. All right. There we go. Those were our comics today. Uh, last thing we're going to talk about then is going to be Sins of Sinister. Okay, get in your questions. Get in your thoughts now. We'll talk a little Sins of Sinister. Okay, so it was announced, I think last week, that the 2023 X-Men, what do you call them, era, is, uh, is going to be called Acronym SOS, and the, the O was red, leading many, including little Dave Stinney over here, to predict it's going to be Sinister-related. It is called The Sins of Sinister. I had schisms of Sinister. I thought they might want to tie in a past X-Men event into the title, but I will not argue that Sins of Sinister sounds better, um, or will not argue against that. It's going to be the Mr. Sinister show. Sounds like he is going to be pretty firmly in control at the end of Immortal X-Men, and this next era is kind of going to be the, here's what happens when Sinister gets what he wants. I'm super here for it. This is one of the most interesting elements of Powers of Ten. It is seated right there. That like, hey, things go wrong when Sinister starts scheming. Moira asked Professor X or told Professor X and Magneto, yo, do not bring him in. Do not bring in Sinister. It will only lead to problems. They did it anyway. And now we're going to get the sins of Sinister. Again, he's got cloned Moira's right now. He is reliving lives and, and bringing that into his experience and creating a database of if I go left here, what does that do? And, uh, and he's going to be in control. He's going to be in control, right? And I think that's great. I, the, the major negative I have with the Sins of Sinister is I don't necessarily mind the X-Men franchise and the Krakoa era being like, all right, we'll just have like an annual era now. I think that'd be fine. Um, but with the Destiny of X, like it has meant something in terms of creator turnover and new series titles happening. But if you remember all the promos for Destiny of X, it was like characters in three different possible futures and three different versions of themselves. None of that stuff has happened. <laughs> like, none of that stuff has happened. So if you were going to say, what even is the Destiny of X, and define it in terms of, like, what is happening on Krakoa, I don't know how you would do that. I don't know what it is. I like the Destiny of X because I like the creators that have taken charge in the series that they have done it on, right? Because the Destiny of X includes Karen Gillan's Immortal X-Men and Al Ewing's X-Men Red and Victor Laval's Sabretooth and Vita Ayala and Rod Race's um, New Mutants, I'm a fan. I think it's actually the best. I think Destiny of X right now is the best the line has been since House and Powers. I actually think that. I think it has the best good comics, like, like on average, the highest batting average across the lineup since the launch. Um, it just doesn't have the hype and the expectations and the what will be of the Dawn of X. You know, if you look at the Dawn of X, Stone Cold Sober, <laughs> which I've never done, can't say, not speaking from experience here, but if you look at that Stone Cold Sober and look at it knowing the Hickman era will, will end too soon 
and that Jonathan Hickman will bail on the franchise way before he's done. It's not that good. It's not that exciting. Okay? Like, if you're actually just looking at the books that are launched as part of the Dawn of X, a lot of misses. Some decent hits. Some decent hits, okay? But I actually think probably the Destiny of X is the best it's been. Um, it's just, you know, we're, we're well past the hype phase is the biggest is the biggest switch. So, like, yes, with the Destiny of X being a bait-and-switch kind of promo thing, like, that's not surprising, and that's not weird, right? Like, yes, you can have promos that ultimately have nothing to do with the content. I, I'm not surprised or bothered by that specifically. It's more of, like, well, what what then is the Destiny of X? And, I mean, I think the main thing it's defined by, or could be defined by, is Gillen's Immortal X-Men and kind of the the sinister versus destiny war and kind of vie for power that's going on here. But then, like, like we just, we haven't tackled a lot of that. We're still, I mean, Immortal X-Men has five issues out. You know, it's very early stages for that. So to get to the sins of sinister, you have to have that boil to a head. Now, it's August. Um, you have four months remaining in the year. You could start building toward that pretty easily and get there by 2023. Um, but as is, I just don't feel like the Destiny of X has had much clarity around what it is. And it, and I guess the thing that bothers me about that is because the books are generally pretty good, It, I don't know that I want to get out of that um, and, and spiral into the Sins of Sinister. You know, I've seen some people say, like, oh, I have event fatigue and I'm tired of crossovers and that and that. I, I don't... I don't know that I think that's what Sins of Sinister is. Um, maybe it is. Maybe I, I don't know. I don't always read stuff very closely. <laughs> like, like, is it literally an event? Uh, or is it just another way of labeling the era? I was interpreting it as a way of labeling, like, the next wave of X-Men comics. That, like, everything's going to be in the Sins of Sinister. If it's, like, a mini crossover or something, where it's, like, okay, a few Mortal X-Men issues, a few X-Men Red issues, you know, maybe one in each X-Line, uh, that doesn't bother me. You know, if it's, if it's contained just to the X-Men or whatever. Um, I don't know. Mar Marvel event fatigue has been a talking point for, I mean, over a decade at this point. Um, but 15 years, right? I mean, when did this, you know, the, the era of events starts in 2004 with Avengers Disassembled. It probably became a major talking point circle like Civil War. So like 2006, 2007. Like it's been talked about. Like it, we are aware, <laughs> you know. Um, but I'm not, if the event's going to be, if it means getting faster to big sinister event type stuff, I'm pretty for it. I'm pretty for it then. I think broadly. Um, but it could go either way. I, yeah, I don't know. I could be wrong. Like maybe it is like straight up an event. I'm kind of interpreting it as an era. Maybe it's just what I'm hoping. I guess that's the thing is like, I think if you did Sins of Sinister as kind of an era, all these books could be playing in basically an infinite multiverse of sinister timelines where he makes different decisions. So you could do incredibly cool stuff that doesn't have to count and stick, right? And I think that would be very, very good for the line. They have not done anything like that. They have not done alternate reality stuff. They have not done multiverse hopping stuff. They have not done what if or even days of future past kind of stuff, sense, house, and powers. And I think the line's missing that. So if Sins of Sinister offers that space, it's going to be great, or at least it has the potential to be. And I think you have enough good creators working on good books right now that I, I have pretty high confidence that it would be. You know? Um, yeah. All right. All right. Sins of Sinister. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I mean, I, things are pretty good right now. For, for the Marvel side of things and for X-Men, you know? Like, Judgment Day is is a really solid event. Gillen's do it. I, I, one thing I'm really interested in, I'm really into what Karen Gillen's been writing over the last five-ish years or so. And one thing I've been batting around is, like, when was the last time, or has this ever happened, where a creator has, like, a pretty acclaimed run with a publisher, like a big two, goes away, does their own thing for a while, and then comes back better than ever. Because I think 
Gillen Wave 2, okay, since returning to do Marvel Universe stuff with Eternals and Immortal X-Men, is a massive upgrade over Gillen Wave 1. Gillen Wave 1 wrote some really good comics. Journey into Mystery, I like a lot. Young Avengers is really good in the Marvel Now era. There's some one, like, there's a Bat Rock one shot that's real good. <laughs> you know, some under the radar stuff too. Um, this was not a creator who needed to come back and prove themselves per se, but Wave 2 is a creator firing on another level. Has anyone else done something like that? I don't know. I mean, obviously, you could throw Hickman in the equation because he, he follows the same path, which is do your Marvel stuff, leave, come back. But Hickman Wave 1 is like my favorite thing to ever happen in the Marvel Universe. <laughs> so Wave 2 is not better. Not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'd have to give it more thought. Because if you look at all the other creators who've kind of left and done their thing, I mean, Brubaker hasn't come back, and I don't imagine will. Matt Fraction, same deal. Um, Brian Michael Bendis, <laughs> I doubt it. Jason Aaron's never left. You know, Rick Remender seems very, very unlikely to want to come back. It just seems like a really rare thing. Uh, maybe there, you know, maybe there's a much older example. I mean, I guess if you technically you could count like Frank Miller, like just on Daredevil, you know, the gap between the first Daredevil run and then Born Again, I guess technically you could count and then Man Without Fear later. Um, but those are shorter spurts. So I don't know, maybe that, maybe that's in the, in consideration. I'm not sure who else I'd have to really, really pull up the list and give it a deep dive, but, but yeah. It's good stuff. Good time to uh, good time to be an X Men fan again. Who are your top three favorite X Men? I'm seeing here in the question: uh, Nightcrawler, Dupe, and hmm, I think that's it. <laughs> I think I really only have a top two. I'll throw Storm in there as number three. I always love a good Storm story. Um, all right, any final questions here? What if, since the Sinister, they took the idea they probably had for Moira and had her different timelines and just gave it to Sinister? Sure. Yep. Here for it. Let's do it. I'm glad they took the time to surgically remove Sinister's racism. If only it were that easy, but yes. Do not need more of that. <laughs> we do not. At all. Uh, maybe Jason Eric could go and come back better. <laughs> Decent wreck. Maybe. I, somebody's going to have to update me on what, what is going on with Avengers stuff. There's like a million Avengers books, Avengers Forever and all this multiverse stuff. And just like, I just, I just need a TLDR. Wait, is that right? Yeah, TLDR on what's going on there. Um, oh, I forgot Magneto. I also forgot Forget Me Not, which does make sense. Good point, Warren. <laughs> Good point. Let's see, final question. Don't, you don't feel like the event is a bit convoluted? Uh, no, it, it actually, like... It should feel more convoluted, but it doesn't. Um, now, you know, I will say here, like, I've read all of the Gillen stuff more than once in the course of, of covering it and talking about it and whatever it is I do here at Comic Book Herald. So that helped. Definitely. Do I think that should be a prereq to enjoy a big old event? Not always. You know, not always. That's a very Grant Morrison approach to something like a final crisis. You know, you have to do your homework. Not everybody wants to or should need to, <laughs> you know. Um, but no, I don't think it's that convoluted. I really don't. I think it's pretty straightforward. Like, like the Judgment Day event right now is, you know, it's two things. It's the Eternals declare war on the mutants. And simultaneously, part of the plan to stop that is to build their own celestial, which then creates Judgment Day on Earth. That's it. Really. You know? And it's, it is fast. It is fast. And that's what I was talking about at the beginning of this. Like, and, and I like that in an event because, it, like, I, I just like that in storytelling, honestly, in a lot of ways. When, you have, when you're a creator who has the confidence to say, we're going to move super fast and drop big reveals because I'm confident I have more of them. I'm not going to run out, okay? You can feel it when a story is like, I have one idea, and I'm going to take my time with it because I don't have any other ideas. <laughs> I like to be 
in the midst of a story where a creator's like, yeah, I can't stop. I can't stop with these good ideas. They're going to keep coming. I'll drop this in issue two. I'll turn this event on its head. I'll drop a Star Fox reveal in issue three. I don't care. I've got more. Let's go. That's way better. That's way better. So no, I, I think it actually is coming together quite nicely. Um, I, I do think, it, I don't know how much sense or how enjoyable this event would be if you hadn't read Eternals leading into it um, and were not like like kind of a fan, honestly. I guess that that I could understand. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm seeing they've completely ignored what happened to the Celestial at Avengers Mountain for the Judgment Day event, so it's not that important. I'm assuming this is reference to uh, the Aaron Avengers. Um, I mean, good. I mean, listen, like, Gillen did, like he, like, he tried to play nicely. Like, he played nicely with Aaron's first arc on Avengers. That set the stage for the Eternals all committing mass suicide and the Celestials totally changing their tone about who and what they are. He played with that. So I would say he's done his time. I would say he's done his time. Um, okay. I think we're good. I think we're good, right? Uh, hey, Dave, what about Sabretooth and the Exiles announcement? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we talked about that. Um, that was announced at the end of Sabretooth, right? That that'd be coming. So hell yeah. Hell yeah. Love Sabretooth. Love Victor Law's work. And Sabretooth and the Exiles is going to rule confident. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. Really appreciate it. You can find all my stuff over at comicbookherald.com. I'll be back next week um, or whenever good comics are released. Uh, I try to do this every Wednesday, basically, if you want to join the live streams. Uh, I should have a decent sized beard next week, so I shouldn't be horrific to look at anymore. (laughs) And hopefully don't scare anyone else. Uh, But seriously, thanks for joining. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, find my stuff, find me online at comicbookherald. Thanks all. Have a good one. Enjoy the comics.